What is going on guys, my name is John and welcome back to yet another video. About 4 months ago I uploaded the 4th generation catch em all, which was by far the hardest one out of the series that I ever had to take on. Just like last time you've all shown your support and asked that I take on the next region, and boy do we have quite a task ahead of us. Today we're going to find out how easily you can catch every Pokemon in Pokemon Black and White. Although this is the 6th video in the series, we're still going to go over the rules that are set in place for this challenge. If you haven't seen any of the videos on the other generations, I have a playlist that you can check out in the top right of your screen to better understand what this is all about. The first rule is that I have to play a copy of Pokemon Black and White. This is unlike most of the other videos, as we only have two games rather than three that we're going to have to play. Because I usually split the available time evenly between all the games, each game is going to have 12 hours to catch everything that they can. The second rule is that we have to obtain each individual Pokemon, and by the end of it there should be a complete living dex of all the Pokemon available in Unova. The third rule is that no glitches can be used. This game is pretty limited on glitches, so I think we'll be perfectly fine without them anyways. But with all of that out of the way, let's just jump right into it. So starting out, I just want to say that this challenge is the most daunting one that I've ever had to take on. These games contain more regional Pokemon than currently any other game, and some of them require quite a lot of work to add to the decks. I usually name the rivals at the top comments for the video, but since these games don't have that option, I just want to give a shout out to the two top comments on the last video. Cecilia M and Pathetic Person. Now usually I try to assign special tasks to each game to make things easier, but these games are very different in that there are a lot of Pokemon that are only available in the post game. There's definitely a lot to talk about, but we'll cover each topic when the time comes. So before you start the run, it's best to set your DS's clock to a specific month in the year. In these games, seasons change different parts of the terrain in the overworld, and it's best to set the time to any of the winter seasons. I chose to play this game on my birthday, but you can also play in the month of April or August and have the same effect. After completing all the intro stuff, our story begins in Nuvema Town when Professor Juniper drops off a package at our home. We meet up with our soon-to-be rivals Charon and Bianca, and we're immediately able to choose our starter from the box on our desk. Because we only have two games, for now we're forced to not use one of the three choices. Although you all really seem to love Snivy, Superior is arguably one of the worst starters in the entire series solely because of its base stats. It has a measly 75 attack and special attack compared to Embor's 123 and 100, so it would be the hardest to use in this type of challenge. I ended up choosing Tepig in black and Oshawott in white. Just like the other videos, we're not going to add these to the total until they've reached their fully evolved forms. After picking our new companions, Bianca and Charon challenge us to a battle and we proceed to destroy our entire home. We head downstairs and talk to our mother, who gives us the cross transceiver and lets us head out to begin our journey. After witnessing one of those awkward fights that your friend's parents have when you stay over, we head to the research lab to meet Professor Juniper and receive the Pokedex, and she instructs that we should meet her on Route 1 to learn how to catch Pokemon. She gives us some Pokeballs to start, and we're going to immediately put them to good use. On this route, Black catches Lillipup, and in white we catch Patrat. At the end of this route is Accumula Town, where we meet Juniper again, and she walks us through some more tutorial stuff. Upon leaving the Pokemon Center, we join a crowd and listen to a guy who definitely doesn't look like they're important to the story at all. When everyone leaves, we meet a guy named N, and are challenged to prove our love for our Pokemon. Now it's time for a pop quiz. What is N's real name? Is it A, Nick, B, Nintendru, or C, Natural Harmonia Gropius? I really wish I was kidding. After defeating him, we head to Route 2 where our mom allows us to run, and we battle Bianca before eventually reaching Striaton City, home of our first gym leader. Before we start collecting any badges, we're going to head east of here and enter the Dream Yard. Although we have to come back here soon, if we take care of all the trainers, we can talk to this woman at the end and she'll give us a Pokemon that will help counter our upcoming battle. In black we receive Pansage, and white receives Panseer, bringing the total to 4 Pokemon. Heading into the trainer's school, we can defeat Charon again, and head into our first gym. This gym is very unique in that the leader you face always has the type advantage over your starter. Normally this would be a very big issue, but because we have our guest from the dream yard, this is a relatively easy fight. After obtaining the badge and leaving the gym, we're greeted by Professor Fennel. She brings us to our lab and requests that we go to the dream yard to get her some dream mist to power her device that hasn't been online since 2013. We receive the HM for cut and progress to meet up with Bianca to find what she's looking for. We find Amuna in the building, as well as Team Plasma, who use a very questionable strategy to get the Dream Mist we're looking for. After defeating the Grunts, we find out the mysterious man's name is Getsis, and they all leave the scene. We head back to Fennel's lab, and she gives us the Sea Gear, which will be completely useless for the entire rest of the playthrough. While Black is heading to Route 3, White is going to head to the Dream Yard one more time to catch Muna, as well as Purloin. 
On the following route, Black takes on Charon and after the battle we find out that the Grunts stole a little girl's Pokemon. We both head into the cave and clear out the Grunts, which allows us to continue to the rest of the story. Before we leave, Black caught two Woobat and Rog and Rolla. White quickly catches up and catches Pit of, before reaching a Korean city with Charon. Before we take on more of the story, if we go to the house on the left of the Pokemon Center, we can grab some X items to help with our story, as well as obtain the mystic water from the girl in the house over. Heading into the museum, we're confronted by Mr. Longname and have a pretty tough fight before receiving a tour inside the building. In the far back is the entrance to the next gym, which is going to be the first big roadblock for each game. This gym is difficult no matter which starter you choose, and that's mostly because it's built around the move Workup, which boosts your attack and special attack by one stage. At this point in the game, offensive boosting moves are pretty overpowered, as you really don't have any options to counter it other than X items. Pig Knight has the ability to learn the TM, but White's Duwad has to really rely on luck to get through this easily. Funny enough, it went the exact opposite as it only took me two tries to beat Lenora. While we wait for Black to catch up, let's take on more of the story. After we receive the badge, Lenora's husband tells us that something is going on in the museum. When we exit the gym, we watch Team Plasma steal an entire Dragonite head in 3 seconds, which is pretty impressive considering that a live Dragonite weighs almost 500 pounds. We then head outside and meet our next gym leader Berg, who wants us to help him chase them down on the next route, which leads to Pinwheel Forest. This location contains a lot of trainers, as well as a lot of Pokemon that we have to obtain. This is also our first encounter with a brand new mechanic to the series, Interactable Spots. If you walk around enough, a patch of grass will start shaking, which implies that a special Pokemon is hiding in the grass. If you go to one, we can catch Audino, as well as catch two Petalil and Sawaddle in the regular grass, bringing the total to 12 Pokemon. At the end of the forest, we find the Grunt, and he hands over the skull, which we then give to Lenora to return to the museum. In turn, she gives us a Moonstone that we'll put to good use later. From here, we can head north to the Sky Arrow Bridge and take a nice stroll to Castilia City. At this point, Black is still deep in the forest, but we did manage to catch Timpole outside of the forest, as well as Venipede, Cottony, and Whimsicott in the Shaking Grass, which is pretty crazy to find in the wild. Upon reaching Castilia City, if we head to the first pier, we can talk to this man who can give us a really useful item. He gives us a stone depending on the Pokemon we said we got from the woman in the Dream Yard. This gives us a Fire Stone that we can use to evolve another one later. Our next task requires us to go to Berg's gym, but we can't take him on just yet. When we get there, he tells us that he wants to meet us at the pier, and we then find out that the Grunt stole Bianca's Muna. After tracking him down from across the gym, we meet up with Gatsis and his sages again, and they give her Pokemon back, and protest more about liberating Pokemon. From here we can take on the gym, which is oddly enough a pretty difficult gym for this game. Although this is a bug-type gym, a majority of the Pokemon here are dual-typed with grass, so you definitely need to be prepared for this one. Black on the other hand is going to have a super easy time with this, which gives a solid opportunity to catch up. I grabbed the Leafstone from the man on the pier and proceeded to sweep through Berg's team without a problem. As we're exiting the gym, we receive a call from Bianca offering to give us some free XP at the Route 4 gate. After destroying her team, we can head to Route 4 to catch Sandile and Scraggy before taking on Charon and doing the same thing. Once we reach the gate on the other end of the route, we meet up with Professor Juniper again who gives us some Ultra Balls to help with the rest of our journey. On the other side of this gate, we reach Nimbasa City where we're immediately greeted with an event. We catch some grunts harassing this old man, and once we defeat all of them, we're given a bike to get around the world a lot faster. By this point in the run, you should have a decent amount of money saved up, which is super important for the rest of the run. If you go into the Pokemon Center, we can buy the TM for Return, which increases in power the higher the Pokemon's happiness is. Considering that we're taking our starters through every battle, this can help counter almost all the Pokemon that we normally have trouble with. It's also important to grab the Soothe Bell in the house above the Pokemon Center to make one of our future evolutions a lot more manageable. If we head towards the east side of the city, we'll have another encounter with N. He basically forces us to go on an awkward ride on the ferris wheel, and then after we have to challenge him like we usually do. This is where I mess up. Now normally this battle is extremely easy, especially for Pig Knight, but luck was definitely not on my side for this section. I somehow didn't knock out his scraggy in one hit, so he ran through the rest of my team. When you lose this, you have to do the whole cutscene over again. I ended up losing to him twice because of a critical hit from his Sigalyph's air cutter, so we're gonna focus on white for a little while. Before we reached Nimbasa City, we finished off Route 4 by catching Darumaka, as well as made sure to purchase the TM for return again. After a normal battle with N, we can immediately take on one of the hardest gyms for this game, Elisa's Gym. This is the final roadblock for this game, and it's for quite a lot of reasons. The most obvious issue is that this gym is based around electric type Pokemon. Almost every hit does at least half health, so you either need to have a bunch of money, or you need to go and heal after every few battles. 
To add to that, almost all the trainers in the gym are unavoidable, and they either have Thunder Wave or the ability Static, so it's almost impossible to get through this without using at least a few Paralyze heals. Taking on Elisa is a whole nother animal. She has two Amolga and Zebstrika, all of which are faster and have the move Volt Switch. This move allows you to attack and then immediately switch out to another Pokemon in your party. This makes it impossible to use X items, so the only way that you can pull this off is if you knock out the rest of your team and only switch into Duat when it's safe. We both only had one Pokemon, and I risked it on a chance that her Volt Switch would get a low roll. I lived on 2 HP. It's almost impossible to win this on your first try, but personally I was able to get the badge on the second. After leaving the gym we meet up with Bianca and pretend to care about costumes for 3 minutes before going outside to- <laughs> I'm sorry, this music just gets me every time. From here we can head west to battle Charon, as well as meet Alder who wants us both to show our strength by teaming up to defeat children. Hmm. Elisa offered to lower the drawbridge at the end of the route for us, but before we do that we have to grab a few Pokemon on this route. On Route 5 we can catch two Minchino, Trubbish, and Solosis before catching Ducklet on the Driftfield drawbridge. At the end we reach the east side of Driftfield City, where we meet the next gym leader Clay that needs us to help him with Team Plasma and the Sages, who are apparently in the cold storage in the southern section of the city. Before we enter the building we can catch Timber, bringing the total to 24 Pokemon. After sliding through a bunch of ice patches, we reach the storage unit they're in, and... Oh. Maybe we should check on Black in the meantime. At this point, Black defeated Elisa, and we made our way to Route 5 to catch Gothita and Lipard before catching Vanillite in the cold storage. After clearing out Team Plasma, we head to Clay's gym to see that Getz has freed all of the grunts that we just captured. Once they all disappear, Clay offers to let us take on his gym, which is probably the most scary gym for this game. His gym focuses on ground type Pokemon, which is an immediate problem because we're weak to that typing, but our starter is also very slow, which means that most of our opponents here are going to move first. After knocking out Clay's Crocorock, I set up on his Palpitoad, which is 100% necessary to get through this. His ace is Extra Drill, which is both fast and stupidly powerful. I don't think it's possible to do this without X items at this level, but fortunately I was able to beat this on my first try. After the battle we received the badge, but our Pig Knight also evolved into Embor. Right after this we're challenged by Bianca on the route's edge, and after defeating her for the 26th time, we're given the HM for fly. This isn't really necessary to have at the moment, but we'll put it to good use soon. Route 6 is a pretty short route, as you can skip literally every trainer here, but it's important to grab two Carablasts before leaving the area. At the end of the route we reach what seems to be a dead end, but Clay uses his Croc Rock to let us access Chargestone Cave. Inside we find N, as well as meet his ninja servants, also known as the Shadow Triad. As we follow him through the cave, we meet up with Bianca and Professor Juniper, who give us the Lucky Egg, which doubles the experience that you get per battle. This is super helpful because we really don't need to hold the charcoal at this point, and with this we can level up a lot faster for our starters, as well as the Pokemon that we have to grind later on. After this I quickly caught two Joltik, bringing us to an even 30 Pokemon. As you probably expected, White is still pretty far ahead, but we're actually both in the Charge Stone Cave at this point. After battling Bianca, our Duat evolved into Samurott, and we managed to catch Deerling on Route 6 and also collected a shiny stone before entering the cave. While I was fighting off all the grunts in the lower floors, I managed to catch 3 Clink, 2 Pharaoh Seed, and Tynamo, which is normally a 2% encounter, but if you go to the lowest floor, it's increased to 8%. I made sure to grab the Thunderstone between all the grunts, and upon reaching the exit, we find N on our challenge to another battle. After the battle, he takes out his anger on Professor Juniper and then heads through the exit. This path leads us to Mistralton City, where we meet Cedric, who is Professor Juniper's dad, and Skylar, the Mistralton City gym leader. She asks us for our help at Celestic Tower at the end of the next route, which is another opportunity to add more Pokemon to our total. After skipping everything on the route, we reach the tower and catch Eldrum, as well as Litwick. I made sure to catch one with the ability Flame Body, which will help speed up the breeding process later on. Once we run through a few trainers, we reach the top of the tower with Skyla, and then ring the bell. She suggests that we should take on her gym, which is around the time that Black is heading up to the top of the tower. I made sure to grab another 3 Litwick here before ringing the bell and also heading to take on Skyla. Her gym is centered around flying type Pokemon, which you'd think would be pretty tough considering our typing, but like I said earlier, the hard sections of the game are pretty much all in the first half of the story. Having access to Return and Flamethrower on Embor made this gym a breeze on top of using a couple X items. After claiming the badge, we meet N outside and head north again to progress to the next town. On Route 7 we can grab Zipstrika and Cupchu before taking on Charon at the end of the route. After the fight we watch Alder make an extremely inhuman jump for a 50 year old and then give us the HM for Surf. 
Just like a lot of the other HMs in this game, this really doesn't have any use in the main story, but at least we can teach this to Samurott for some powerful stab. Right above here is the entrance to Twist Mountain. Normally this mountain has a bunch of different levels that you have to traverse through to make it to the exit, but because we set the game to the winter season, we can skip all of it. I'm not exactly sure how much time this saves, but you pass about 10 potential trainers, so I'm sure you're turning a 20 minute trip into about a minute and a half. Before we exit the area, we're going to catch two Boldor and Trilber through the dust clouds. Right before White enters the mountain, we caught Watchhog before following the same path to the exit. I forgot to mention that the center of the mountain also has a rare candy, which is always a welcome addition to our bag. After we exit the mountain, we talk to Cedric again and reach Icarus City. There are a bunch of things that we have to do here, but the most important thing for now is to take on the gym. Bryson is the ice type leader in these games, and his gym is just as easy as the rest of the ice type gym leaders. The layout for this area is pretty straightforward, but there is one weird thing that I want to know. For some reason this rock doesn't have any collision data, so you can pass right through it. This lets you skip a trainer, so technically it's a glitch, but I figured that we were on the same page that an actual glitch that would break the rules would be a lot more impactful than letting you just skip a trainer. After destroying his team, we receive the 7th badge and meet up with Charon and Bianca outside. Bryson comes outside and does some kind of sixth sense thing and the shadow triad appears. They mention that they're going to the Dragon Spiral Tower north of here where their plans will be completed. Before we head inside, we're going to hunt in the snow above the gym and catch Sawsbuck before talking to Cedric and Bianca and going inside. On the bottom floor of the tower, we can catch two Golet and Dredigan before starting to fight off the hordes of Team Plasma members. Look guys, I get you're into the whole hugging thing, but I'm not the one. Black is slightly behind as we also had to stop on top of the gym to catch Mianfu, two Vanillish, and Beartick. After clearing through all the grunts, we reach the top and find out that N has successfully summoned the legendary Pokemon, and we meet up with Alder who says he's heading to the Relic Castle to stop them from finalizing their plans. From here we fly to Nimbasa City and head back to Route 4 to enter the Desert Resort. We can skip this whole section for the time being and enter the Relic Castle to hunt down Team Plasma. If we talk to this person, we can receive the Plume Fossil, which we'll revive later on. As we progress through the floors, we can catch Yamask, Kafagrigus, and Krokorok. This brings us to roughly one third of all the Unifa Pokemon. Yikes. As White heads to the Relic Castle, we're able to catch Maractus and obtain the Cover Fossil before dropping down to confront Getsis with Alder and Charon. He tells us that it's already too late to stop N, so we exit the area to work on our game plan. As we're leaving the castle, Professor Juniper screams in our ear that she wants us to meet her in the Crane City with everyone else. Upon arriving there, we're entrusted with the Dark Stone that contains the other legendary Pokemon. We all then realize that we have no idea how to get him out of the stone, but Alder suggests that the gym leader of Opelucid City might be able to help us. From here we flew to Icarus City, and because it's winter we can skip all the encounters and trainers on Route 8. At the end of the route we can take on Bianca and show her that she's really as bad as she thinks she is. After this we head to the bridge and are confronted by Getsus and the Shadow Triad, and he spits his usual evil stuff before saying that he's also heading to Opelucid City. After skipping through Route 9, we reach the city and meet up with Alder to watch Getsus' TED talk on releasing Pokemon. When the crowd disappears we meet up with Drayden and Iris, who are the two gym leaders of Opelucid City. They bring us to their house and tell us the story of the two legendary Pokemon, and then challenge us to take on the final gym of the region. This gym is focused around Dragon-type Pokemon, and this really isn't as difficult as you'd think. It is however by far the longest one as you can't skip any of the trainers and the dragon animations take forever, but having access to return on both Pokemon makes us a breeze. After defeating Iris and White, we're given the final badge and can finally take on the Pokemon League. As we're exiting the building, we meet up with Professor Juniper who congratulates us on somehow conquering the region in like 5 hours, and then gives us the Master Ball. As usual this will be extremely useful later on. Heading north of the city we reach Route 10. Here we can catch Fungus and Throw before taking on Sharon at the end of the bridge to determine who will fight N at the Pokemon League. After mopping his team, we can head through the gates and catch Rufflet before heading into Victory Road. Compared to a lot of the other games, this area is actually really easy to traverse, but we're going to stay here for a bit to catch Durant inside, as well as Heatmore and two Fracture outside. This brings a total to 58 Pokemon. After Black defeats Drayden and claims the final badge, we also receive the Master Ball and head to Route 10 to catch most of the Pokemon that White didn't. Here we can catch Bufalon, Sock, Vullaby, and two Hurtier. It's also important to grab the Dust Stone from the Man Near the Dark Grass for a later evolution. When we reach Victory Road, we take a decent amount of time to catch three Dino and Excadrill. Yeah, that's gonna be a fun one. By the time we reach the entrance to the Pokemon League at the top of the mountain, White has already beat all of the Elite Four members. Because our Samurott is such a high level at this point, it's almost impossible to lose if you make the right plays. 
The hardest member by far is Chantal. Pokemon like Jellicent completely wall Samurott, and we literally have to spam not effective moves until they finally knock out. Once all the members are defeated, we can head up to the stairs to the Champions Hall to take on N. When we get there though, we find out that Alder lost to him, making N the champion of the region. He then, on command mind you, makes an entire mansion rise out of the ground and surround the entire Pokemon League with stairs connecting to the building. Not exactly the best design choice in my opinion, but I would like his creativity. He then escapes into his castle and now it's our chance to take him on. Once we climb to the top floor, we meet up with Getsus who tells us that their plans of liberating all the Pokemon are in effect. When we head inside, we confront N, and he summons Reshiram and proves that he really doesn't care too much about what this place looks like. Suddenly, the dark stone in our pocket opens up, and we somehow summon the other legendary Pokemon, Zekrom. Now is our opportunity to take him on. Ever since Generation 4, the box legendaries for each game have been progressively easier to catch, and these two aren't exempt from that. Its catch rate is so high that you almost have a 12% chance to catch it at full health with a Pokeball. I feel like this kind of eliminates the legendary aspect of it, but after 4 dust balls we were able to add it to the total. Now that we each have a legendary Pokemon, N challenges us to our final battle. This is actually a pretty tough fight because of how diverse his team is, but if you use the legendary you get, you can knock out a couple members of his team before having your starters sweep the rest. After defeating him, Getsus arrives and disowns N, but also reveals that the liberation thing was just a trick, and he only wanted that so he could be unstoppable and rule the region with just his Pokemon. He challenges us to an even more difficult battle, and we get to enjoy the most intense music out of the entire game. After we defeat him, we're basically done with the main story. Alder and Sharon take Getsus away, and we have a heart to heart talk with N about our love for Pokemon. He sends out his Pokemon, and then rockets off into the sunset. From here we're ready to take on the massive post game, but before we do that, let's finish off Black's side of the game. After defeating all the Elite Four members, we follow the same path and summon the opposite Pokemon for this game, Reshiram. After throwing a single Dusk Ball, we've captured a total of 66 Pokemon, but there are many, many more that we have to collect in the postgame. If you didn't know, the main story pretty much only covers the left side of the region, which leaves us with the other side, as well as some other little extensions we have to run through to obtain the rest. If you also haven't noticed, at this point in the game it's rolled over to nighttime, which I plan to make catching Pokemon a lot easier. This is definitely the most optimal way to do this, but it's still not an easy task. When we start up the game again, we're back in our bedroom and we meet up with our mom and Looker who tells us about some side quests that we're definitely not going to take part in. We have a quick chat with Sharon and Bianca before we're completely free to roam the region as we please. The first thing we're going to do is catch all the Pokemon that I missed on my way through the story. On Route 3 we can catch Blitzel, in the Pinwheel Forest we can catch Pampor in the Shaking Grass, but I also managed to catch another Pansage which helps save a ton of time later on. Heading back to Twist Mountain, we can grab Cryogonal, who is normally a 1% encounter, but if it's winter, it's boosted to 5%. This is actually the last thing that you get as a benefit from the winter season, so we need to change it to any other season than this one to collect more Pokemon. Heading north of Icarus City, we can catch two Palpitoad and Stunfisk, before heading back to the Pinwheel Forest to catch two Whirlipede in the new extension. This brings the total to 72 Pokemon. Now let's check out the newer routes. If we head all the way back to Route 1, we can surf west of here and catch Basculin, but we also have access to Route 18 and 19 past the gate. In the water we can catch two Frillish and Elamomola before going to the top of this cliff to receive a special Pokemon. The ranger in this building here will give us an egg, which saves us a decent amount of time than actually breeding for it. If we maneuver around the current, we can reach a special grass area where we can finish off the Pokemon for this area. Between the dark and regular grass, we can catch another Scraggy, Crustle, and Dwebble before heading to Driftville City to collect a Waterstone for later. At this point, I realized that I missed another Pokemon, so I went back to Route 9 to catch two Gotharita, which pretty much completes all of the left side of the region. The only two Pokemon that this game has to worry about on the opposite side is Mandibuzz on Route 11 and Mianxiao on Route 14. Our last new location is going to be all the way back at the Relic Castle. If you enter the doorway next to where we previously spoke with Getsus, we can enter a small maze of the Relic Castle. After we meet one of the sages, we can enter this small room and encounter Volcarona. This is another one of those not legendary legendary Pokemon, so as long as you can live a couple attacks from a level 70 Pokemon, this shouldn't be too tough to take on. After leaving the maze, I managed to catch another high level Krokorok, but at this point I realize that I'm running really short on time. I decided to add a couple more tasks to the other version, but we'll talk more about that later. After this we can head to Route 7 and see if there's a huge storm going on. In this house we can meet a woman who tells us about a Pokemon that's causing the big storm, and after we leave, we come to face to face with it. Tornadus is one of the roaming Pokemon for this region, and although we don't have a radar to find them like you could in Gen 4, they're actually pretty easy to find. 
If you read the message board in the route's gates, they'll tell you exactly what route the Pokemon is on. Sometimes they move by the time that you get there, but if you do the classic trick where you go in and out of the routes, you'll eventually find it in the area. Because we still have our Master Ball, we can quickly add Tornadas to the total. Our final stop is going to be the Giant Chasm. The only reason that this game goes here is to catch a Ditto for breeding, but we'll come back to the area later to finish it off. Before we do this next part, it's important to go into Kreen City's museum and revive the fossil that we received to get Archon. The breeding section for this game is relatively short, as we ended up catching some of the Pokemon that we needed to breed on our way here. After biking around for quite a bit, our eggs hatch into another Archon, Tepig, our second Panpour, and the egg we received on Route 18 turned into Larvesta. All we have to do from here is grind out the rest, so let's check out the postgame for White. After going through the same dialogue in Uvema Town, we begin covering the Pokemon that we missed by going to the Dream Yard to catch another Muna, Emolga on Route 6, Garbodor and two Duosian on Route 9, and Amoongus on Route 10 before changing the season to Autumn to collect the rest. This makes it possible to catch two Shelmet on Route 8, and two Tranquil at the Dragon Spiral Tower. We also head to the extension on the Pinwheel Forest to get two Swad Loon, as well as two Girder on the Twist Mountain. Our last repeated location is going to be at the Desert Resort. In the sand we can catch Sigalyph, before reaching the Relic Castle and meet up with Professor Juniper. She mentions that the statues we're surrounded by are actually Pokemon, and she gives us a Rage Candy Bar to wake one of them up. This helps add Darmanitan to the total, bringing the count to 95 Pokemon. Before we can grab the new route Pokemon, it's important to grab the HM for Waterfall on Route 19, as both games can't access a version exclusive without it. If we head east of Nimbasa City, we can eventually reach the Marvelous Bridge. This is a great place to grind out feathers for money, but it's also the only location where you can catch Swana. After reaching the White Forest, we went east of Opelucid to Route 15. In the Dark Grass, we can catch Braviari and Bisharp, who is a 5% encounter. I imagine I was going to have to level up to get one, but I managed to find one in under 5 minutes. Because of this, I went back to Route 9 to catch its pre-evolution, Ponyard, bringing the toll to 99 Pokemon. After this, I caught BHM on Route 14, before following the path to Miss Stralton Cave for some special events. In here, we can catch Axew on any floor, but if we reach the top floor, we'll meet an old man who tells us his journey to hunt down the legendary trio for this region. He says that he found one of them hidden in this cave, and being the people that we are, we're going to steal all of his hard work and take it for ourselves. The first one we meet is Cobalion. This Pokemon is as difficult to catch as the rest of the legendaries in these games, but because of all the Dusk Balls, we have roughly a 10% chance on every throw. After a couple minutes, we can add it to our party. The old man talks to us after, and says that the rest of the trio is probably waiting for us somewhere, so let's just ruin his entire career and take them on too. If we fly at the Pokemon League and take the left path in Victory Road, we can catch Terrakion. And in the deepest part of the Pinwheel Forest extension, we can catch Virizion. I wish I had more to say here, but this took me all of 15 minutes to do, so there really isn't a lot that's challenging about this. The last Pokemon that we have to collect for now is going to be the Roma for this game. After going through routes for only a minute, we're able to find Thunderous and use our final Master Ball to finish off this section. Now it's time to breed some Pokemon. At this point you've probably realized, wait a second, you only have two of the starters. And you're right. Because there are only two games in this series, we're going to just have to trade over another one from a fresh save file. This is going to be a trend for pretty much all the future videos for this series, but we did the same thing about four times in Generation 1, so it's really not anything out of the ordinary. Because we weren't very lucky with encountering a couple Pokemon throughout the main story, the breeding section took a little bit longer than I would have liked. Obviously before this, I revived the cover fossil to get Tortuga, but with the eggs I was able to get two more Snivy, two more Oshawott, Panseer, another Tortuga, and two more Tynemo, bringing the total to 108 Pokemon. Before we hop into all the grinding, we're going to take care of those little extra things that I mentioned earlier. If we head all the way back to the giant chasm where we caught Ditto, there's a giant forest maze that we can go through. In the center is a small pond, and when we get near it, we hear a cry and the area becomes completely covered in snow. If we go to the back of the snow area, we can enter the small cavern and take on the legendary Pokemon, Kirim. This one took the longest out of all the legendaries, but after only 5 minutes we can add this one to the total. The final Pokemon that we need to get requires a little bit of work from both games. If we trade the Tornadus from Black and put Thunderous in the party with us, we can unlock the final event. On Route 14, there's a large waterfall that lets us access an area called the Abundant Shrine. In the far back, there are a group of kids talking about how there are stories of a legendary Pokemon in this area. We then proceed to do a magic trick and Landorus falls down from the sky. 
This is by far the most challenging Pokemon that we have to catch, as this is the highest level wild Pokemon, and it also has the same catch rate as the rest of the legendaries in this game. After chucking a few Dusk Balls, we can obtain the final Pokemon, which brings our total to 110 Pokemon. Now it's time to grind out our catches. After knocking out about 1500 Audino, we were able to evolve Tepig to Pignite, Herdier to Stoutland, Palpatode to Seismitoad, Whirlipede to Scolipede, Frillish to Jellicent, Scraggy to Scrafty, Crocorock to Crocodile, Archon to Archaeops, Gotharia to Gothitelle, Vanillus to Vanillex, Joltik to Galvantula, 2 Litwick to Lampent, 2 Dino to Zwilus, and Zwilus to Hydreigon. As for the other evolutions, I evolved Lampent to Chandelure with the Fire Stone, Pampor to Simipor with the Water Stone, Pansage to Simisage with the Leaf Stone, and Wubat to Swubat through Friendship. This brings a total to 128 Pokemon. As for White version, I evolved 2 Snivy to Servine, Servine to Superior, Oshawa to Duwat, Tranquil to Unpheasant, Tortuga to Caracosta, Duosian to Reuniclus, Pharisee to Ferrothorn, 2 Clink into Clang, Clang into Clink Clang, 2 Tynemo into Electric, Fracture to Haxorus, and Golette into Golurk. For the other evolutions, I evolved Muna to Musharna with the Moonstone, Panseer to Simiseer with the Firestone, Minchino to Sinchino with the Shiny Stone, Petalil to Lilligant with the Sunstone, Electric to Electros with the Thunderstone, and Swadloon to Leovanny through Friendship. To finish our decks, we can trade Girder and Boldor to get Conkledur and Gigalith, as well as trade Shelmet and Carablast at the same time to get a Selgor and a Scavalier. This brings a total to 150 Pokemon, as well as all the main Pokemon that are available in the Unova region. But there are technically still a couple more that we can get. Just like Generation 4, there are quite a few event-only Pokemon that we can collect. If we head to the Pokemon Transfer Lab, we can bring over some special event Pokemon from Generation 4, which have additional features in the post-game of Black and White. I used an actual event cartridge that I bought so I could get these events, and one of these is actually an unreleased event. I made a video on this a while back, so if you want to learn more about how I did this, there's a link in the top right corner that you can check out after the video. After transferring over a Celebi and a Shiny Suicune, we can take care of two very special Pokemon. If we take Celebi to Castilia City, we can enter this building and see two people talking. If we talk to the girl, she'll explain that the boy doesn't want to be talked to, but Celebi will break out of the Pokeball and interact with the person. The boy ends up turning into the Pokemon Zoroa, and we can add it to our party. I'm still a little concerned about how unfazed this girl was that she wasn't even talking to a person. After this, we can head east of Nimbasa City to get to Route 16, and if we go north of here, we can access a small area called the Lost Lauren Forest. When we walk into the clearing, we'll find a camper, as well as a woman, who then proceeds to attack us. Who came up with these events? The woman then becomes a Raikou, and then after damaging it, it shows its true identity, Zoroark. After quickly capturing it, the area completely changes, and a man tells us that the Pokemon made an illusion for the entire area. This brings a total to 152 Pokemon. The final few Pokemon require a lot more effort. If you remember at the end of Generation 4, I used a DNS exploit to grab the last mythical Pokemon that we need. This method also works in this generation, which means that we can obtain the events for Keldeo and Meloetta, but Genesec seems to be the only Pokemon that's unobtainable. I did some research and found out that it was only available in stores for the game's sequels, and I believe that the server that runs this doesn't have access to any of the Wi-Fi events that used to be available. I could have just been unlucky, but I spent about 30 minutes searching for it, so I think it's just not obtainable at this time. The last thing that we can get from this is an event item, the Liberty Pass. If we pick up the item from the Pokemon Center and head to the far left pier of Castelia City, we can take a boat to Liberty Garden. This area contains a bunch of Taurus, but it also has the remnants of Team Plasma, which is super funny once you actually beat the game, because this event was primarily designed to be unlocked right when you got to Castelia City. After letting them know that their group doesn't really exist anymore, we can head into the bottom of the lighthouse and battle the mythical Pokemon Victini. Although it's only level 15, it has the same catch rate as a legendary, so it definitely took quite a bit to add it to our team. With this, we've captured 155 Pokemon, as well as pretty much every regional Pokemon that's available in Pokemon Black and White. But how did I do? So let's review. If you weren't paying attention to the post half of the game, it's pretty obvious that this was an extremely tough challenge. The amount of preparation that went into making this video happen was actually worse than Generation 4, and that's entirely because of the amount of things that you have to go out of your way to get to make this easier in the long run. In Pokemon White, I finished with a time of 11 hours and 55 minutes. 
I actually finished at around 11.35, but because I had to help out with Kiram and Landorus, I just barely completed it. Obviously the events took an additional 30-ish minutes of in-game time, but I never counted those because you're not really intended to get them after the servers were shut down. It took me about 4 tries to get this run down, and I'm pretty proud of it. Ashwan has a pretty rough time in the beginning, but I lucked out through pretty much all the gym leaders. And now for the disappointing part. In Pokemon Black, I finished with a time of 12 hours and 53 minutes. Which means I failed the challenge. A lot of you might be disappointed or upset that I wasn't able to complete this in 24 hours, but let me explain why for the people that don't understand. There is no denying that this is by far the hardest game to take on. Generation 4's games were definitely hard too, but the only thing that really made it difficult were the honey trees. Getting to that point takes only about 3-4 to four hours, where in this game it takes minimum 5 hours to just beat the story. Between both games, there were roughly 30 Pokemon that had to be evolved, and considering that 10 of them took more than 30-45 to 45 minutes to do, it adds up very quickly no matter how fast you run through the game. I know some of you might mention that I could have used past powers to increase the amount of experience I got in battles, but those powers don't last very long, and it would probably take longer to get enough pass orbs to complete that. I reached the grinding section of Black 4 times, and no matter how quickly I finished the main story, there were just wasn't enough time to take care of everything. Evolving Dino to Hydreigon took 45 minutes in itself, so hopefully that paints a little bit of a picture of the postgame. It took about 5 hours to evolve all the Pokemon, so Black only had about 2 hours to take care of all of the pre-grinding postgame. That sounds like a decent amount of time, but you'd have to know this game on an active speedrunner level to finish it in time. All things considered though, I think this really isn't a terrible run. Nobody wants to admit they can't do something, and I'm extremely stubborn about those things, but hopefully you can all understand where I'm coming from. On the upside, there is a sequel to this game, and a lot of the Pokemon I grinded are catchable in the wild, so I promise that I will redeem myself when the time comes. Other than that, that's all there is to say about catching every Pokemon in black and white. And that's going to do it for today's video. If you liked the video, leave a like and consider subscribing, as I'll be uploading more videos like these very soon. If you have any suggestions for videos that you'd like to see, leave a comment below. Follow me on Twitter to keep updated with new videos as they come out. Other than that, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one.